This video will go over a review of blood gases. First, the indications, then the components of blood gases, and finally, a simple approach to interpreting blood gases. Again, hopefully for most of you, this is a review. Let's start by talking about the indications for blood gases. The most common one that think people think about is respiratory failure. And within respiratory failure, you can have hypoxemic respiratory failure or hypercapnic respiratory failure. Oftentimes, a blood gas is helpful for assessing the severity of the respiratory failure. You can also use blood gases for ventilatory management. Once a patient's on a ventilator, you can use blood gases to titrate that ventilator. Another indication for blood gases that people don't necessarily think about is circulatory failure. I find that when a patient is in shock, using a blood gas can help, again, quantify the severity of the shock. Another indication for blood gases is altered mental status. If you're not quite sure what's going on with the patient, getting a blood gas can help you determine whether one, they're in respiratory failure, two, they have circulatory failure, which is clearly a cause of altered mental status, or if there's some other sort of toxin ingestion that a blood gas can be helpful in elucidating. And finally, we can use blood gases for electrolyte derangements. The most common electrolyte derangement is DKA, or diabetic ketoacidosis. But it also can be helpful for a patient who presents with hyperkalemia. If you remember, there is a potassium hydrogen co-transporter, and a patient with hyperkalemia may actually have a profound acidosis. Let's move on to a case. Here's a case of a 55-year-old male who's been ventilated for the past two days, secondary pneumonia, and has sudden hypoxemia on the ventilator. Here's the question. Do you need a blood gas? I would argue you don't need a blood gas. Even though we said respiratory failure is an indication for obtaining a blood gas, sometimes you can intervene before you investigate. And this is a dichotomy I want you to think about throughout your medical career, particularly when you're taking care of acutely ill patients. You can intervene or you can investigate. Often you have to do both but there are some times when investigation delays the intervention. And in this example, where a patient is suddenly hypoxemic on a ventilator, you don't need a blood gas to tell you that the patient is sick. You just need to do something about it. And let's now look at a blood gas. 7.18 30 92 16. It's okay if these numbers don't mean anything to you right now, but this is often how they're written and reported without actually telling you what the values mean, because we have a shorthand. Let's go through each one in detail. A component of a blood gas includes the pH, and in this case it's 7.18. The normal value for a pH is 7.35 to 7.45, give or take. The next value reported in a blood gas is almost always the CO2, and in this case it was 30. Now a normal value of CO2 is between 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury. The next value of blood gas reported is the PXO2, and I say X because it depends on what type of blood gas you've obtained to tell you what the partial pressure of oxygen is. In this case, we can assume it's an arterial blood gas, so you can say P little AO2. And again, if you remember the blood gas that we read, it was 92. Now what's the normal value of a P little AO2? It actually totally depends. Let's go in more detail into this. So PXO2 is only meaningful if it's an arterial blood gas. We often obtain venous blood gases, and sometimes we obtain even capillary blood gases. A venous and capillary blood gas, the PXO2 is not meaningful. So we use it when we have an arterial blood gas. But we need to have other information as well before we interpret that. It depends on the FiO2, and it requires calculating the AA gradient to fully interpret the P little AO2. For healthy individuals breathing room air at sea level, the P little AO2 is somewhere between 80 and 100 millimeters of mercury. Now moving on to the bicarb. In our case, the bicarb was 16. Normal bicarb is between 22 and 26 millimoles per liter. There are other values within blood gases, and let's just go through a few of them. First, sometimes you'll see the saturation of oxygen. Now with an arterial blood gas, the saturation of oxygen on the blood gas should be almost identical to that saturation of the pulse oximetry, because that's what it's measuring. The pulse oximetry is measuring the saturation of the arterial gas. 
Now, the saturation of blood gas is actually really important when we talk about the mixed venous saturation from a mixed venous blood gas, which is collected from a central line. It's important in assessing oxygen delivery, particularly in patients with circulatory failure. We'll save this for another day, but an important thing to remember. Also, you can see a lactate. A normal lactate is less than two. And finally, sometimes you'll find a base deficit or excess. This is a calculated value from the blood gas. A base deficit means there's a metabolic acidosis. A base excess means there's a metabolic alkalosis. Let's go back to our case. Here's the blood gas, 7.18, 30, 92, 16. I think there's six steps to interpreting a blood gas. And it's a systematic approach. First, I look at the pH. Is it normal? Is it acidic? Or is it basic? In the case of this example, it's acidic. The second step I look at is whether the CO2 is normal, acidic, or basic. In this case, it's basic. Then I look at the bicarb. Is the bicarb normal, acidic, or basic? And in this case, it's acidic because it's lower than it should be. Step four is I match the pH with the CO2 and or bicarb that is consistent with the pH. In our example, the bicarb is acidic and consistent with the pH, which is acidic. The next step, step five, I look for compensation in either the CO2 or the bicarb. And in fact, in this case, the CO2 is lower than it should be. It's alkalotic and therefore it's compensating the pH, which is acidic. So putting it all together, this is a primary metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation. The sixth part of assessing a blood gas is looking at the P little AO2, the partial pressure of oxygen in the artery. We'll save interpreting this for a little bit later. To sum up, we've listed the indications for obtaining a blood gas. We've defined the components of blood gas and their normal values. We've interpreted the acid-base status of a blood gas using the five-step approach. Now, we're going to continue by practicing questions. All these practice questions are looking at the acid-base status of blood gas. And at the end, then we'll revisit step six, assessing the P little AO2 of a blood gas.